Hello, welcome to my video, and in this video I'm covering the round 12 of candidates in 2013. And in this game, Carlsen was playing against uh, Vasily Ivanchuk, who didn't have such a good tournament until this point. I think he had like four and a half points after 11 rounds, so it was not a great tournament for him. And uh, Carlsen had a chance now to increase his lead with a win with white pieces. And uh, this game was very interesting. It was a very interesting endgame that you will see very soon. But before that, let's get through the opening and middle game and get to the very interesting rook endgame which appeared. So we had 1e4 and we had the Taiman of Sicilian after a slightly altered uh, move order because here usually white plays d4 but magnus chose knight c3 and for example if black was Ma if magnus was black here he would maybe play e5 here uh, to stop d4 but uh, the e5 move here weakens the d5 square so it has some positional drawbacks so even to plays e6 and now we get to the Taimanov, I think. If I'm wrong, just correct me in the comment section. And uh, we have queen c7 here, bishop e3. And now a6. This is very typical, a6 and e6 to stop any knight b5 jumps. Now queen d2 for white. And black also finishes, continues development with knight f6 castles and now i think the most principled way to continue is bishop b4 to pin the knight and attack the e4 pawn this way so that's why magnus plays f3 keeping this pawn alive and and now black has several options one of them is castles one of them is d5 as well this looks very logical and now in case of ed to just recapture with the knight and to threaten to damage the pawn structure on the queen side but maybe after d5 the best is to just go a3 and to i think temporarily sacrifice the pawn for example if you take on c3 you can take it and on fe i think that's a very good is knight c6 followed by knight bishop c5 and that way black cannot castle and he has some issues with developing but here in this position even took played knight e7 and after knight b3 and now he goes d5 uh, the idea behind uh, knight e7 wasn't to capture on c3 because it would leave dark squares pretty vulnerable on b6 and d6 and the whole complex of dark squares will be used by white uh, the point of 97 was probably just to play d5 on the next move and in case of e5 to have maybe uh, knight f5 and then bishop d7 rook c8 and to put pressure on the c3 knight so he plays d5 but now Magnus plays e5, and it's not possible to capture on e5 now, because of f4. Uh, sorry, because of bishop f4. If you go f4, then you can just go queen h5, and the queen is not in danger. But after bishop f4, uh, he can go to h5, but g4 can be played, and very soon... Black has to decide to give up the piece, because if he goes to g6, then bishop d3 is decisive. So probably here he would have to take on g4, but that uh, that leaves black without a piece, although with three pawns for as a compensation, but uh, with the king being in the center, I think that after bishop p2, rook g1, it's going to be very dangerous to be black. So 
this pawn is not for grabs and a black played knight d7 and now he has to defend the pawn by f4 and now b6 he's trying to activate his bishop from c8 somehow and now bishop d4 by white he tries to just establish some control over the d4 square and now knight c5 this was the point behind uh, the move b6 because if you don't play b6 uh, white has an option of taking on c5 but here it's not that good because if you let's say take on c5 there's bc as an option and uh, this small center looks very very good for black because he might push d4 on the next move and it can be quite unpleasant for white so here white plays a3 and now black jumps to e4 queen goes back to e1 and now we have some exchanges takes takes and now black doesn't have anything against uh, exchanging and ruining the pawn structure of white and after a queen trade we have this position in which black has a better pawn structure obviously because of doubled c pawns uh, but white has more space because his pawns are much more advanced than blacks and also white has a good outpost on d4 for the knight so uh, this position is some in some sort of balance black has better structure and white has more space and uh, better place pieces overall and now uh, black plays a5 in this position which i don't really prefer it's not my cup of tea this move because it weakens the b5 square if i was black here i would play something like bishop b uh, bishop b7 slash d7 and not uh, committing too much with the queenside pawn moves let's say something like bishop d7 uh, then go for a castle rook c8 and uh, put pressure on the c3 pawn but maybe black was concerned about c4 at some point although i don't know even if even if uh, white plays c4 you can take it and still have a better structure but a5 wasn't such a such a mistake and now knight d4 by magnus and bishop a6 this was the idea behind a5 and now white plays bishop d3 uh, he's trying to fix his structure in case of some bishop trade uh, also here king d2 was interesting to play just to get rook b1 in and to put some pressure on the b6 but i don't think it's so dangerous for black because black can just include his king get to c7 and that way he can hold the position so bishop d3 is played king d7 king d2 now transposes knight c6 and now rook b1 and now we have some exchanges bishop d3 and king takes d3 a white of course doesn't want to take with the c pawn because in case of this this uh white uh, white has one against two on the queen side and that's not uh, desirable for him even though white can just hold it with rook b5 something like this rook b5 rook hb1 and keep some control but that's a bit too passive i mean it's defending actively but it's not uh, giving any chance for a win so he played king takes d3 he kept his structure like this 
and also he kept some options for himself. And of course, now white is hoping that uh, black will fix his structure by capturing on d4. Although even here it's not uh, anything special for white. You can go rook hc8. I mean first this, rook hc8, and keep it pretty much comfortably. So, after this move, rook ab8 is played, and now knight b5. White is seeking for a d6 square and trying to interfere with black's pieces. And now we, we see we are going to see a very typical pawn break for this kind of structure, which resembles the French defense structure. And that's g5. Trying to separate uh, the f and e pawns in the center and trying to get some counterplay on the king side. So that's why white plays g3, just to keep this pawn chain alive, and now rook h g8 by black. He doesn't want to take on f4 first, because in that case white is ready to meet rook h g8 by rook h1, and uh, after some rook g3, rook a, a bg1 we would have a, I would say equal position but this move <clears throat> is keeping tension in the center and if white plays something like this then black can build up with rook g6 and then double and in the end it's gonna be tough to hold this this tension on f4 and also, if you take on g5, then the e5 pawn becomes quite loose, and after rook g5, it's impossible to defend the e5 pawn. So here it's important to notice that uh, you don't have to break tension so early. You can just go rook g6. And then when you build up some pressure with rook bg8, when you double the rooks, and when the rook on g1 is vulnerable enough, you can then take on f4. Uh, but here uh, Magnus doesn't play rook hg1, he plays c4. The point behind this move is to open up, to make uh, the king on d7 more vulnerable. But as you will see, that move is not su such a good move. Such a good choice. Now Ivanchuk takes on, uh, on f4, gh, and now knight e7. And now he is preparing for cd, knight takes d5, and to attack on f4. But here actually, this was the interesting choice, and I'm not sure why he didn't like this one, because if you take back on c4, there is rook g4. And then black has dual threats like knight e5, and rook takes f4. And uh, if you just play king e4, then black gets much uh, much more activity with rook g2. And also the c-pawn becomes a target. The rook on g2 is quite active and uh, black's chances are quite good for the advantage. Uh, but he played knight e7 here. And now rook hg1. Now he's trying to to seize the control over the g file, and now Ivanchuk takes on c4, takes, and knight d5. And now the position becomes quite unpleasant for white, because uh, white's pawns are much more vulnerable at this point, especially f4, which is the main focus of black's play. And white tries something to mix things up, knight d6, trying to attack the f pawn, king c6. And now white takes on f7 and black takes on f4. Although the material is quite reduced, it seems like black is much more pleasant. Because his king on c4 is much more exposed than the king on c6. And also the pawn on e5 seems a bit more shaky. So white plays king b3 here. King goes to c5, just 
getting more space. Knight g5 and now h6, knight e4, king d4. And now this pawn on e5 looks quite, quite endangered. Now Magnus plays knight f6 and he's hoping for this because there is a fork. So black takes on g1, takes and rook c8, just stepping aside from any geometry. Now white has to defend the pawn by rook e1 and now it's time to activate the rook by rook c3. Uh, here king a4 just loses because of rook c2. So king b2 looks logical here and now rook f3. And now black wants to go just rook f2 and to collect some pawns. So white tries with rook e4, king c5 and now knight d7. We have this repetition and black chose to go back to c6. Knight goes back to f6 and now knight g6. With a small threat of knight takes e5 to, dis to just destabilize this knight on f6. That's why white gives a check, king b5, and now rook e4. Now the point of this check was to lure the king to b5, which is a more active square, but now knight e5 doesn't work because there is a check on e5. So you cannot collect the knight. But that's why black plays rook f5, just attacks for the second time this pawn on e5. And now knight e8. Uh, I believe here that a4 was much better. Just fixing these pawns on the queen side. And after king c5, king b3. Now in case of knight takes to just hold it with c3 and it's not very easy to to get any advantage from this because if you take on f6 white's gonna take and after this let's say rook b5 king c6 and then rook h5 and the rook is stuck defending this uh, h6 pawn the king is stuck always it has to worry about b6 pawn so I think that white has uh, good chances to survive this. And if he needs, white can go king c4 at any moment and start putting some pressure even more. If the king gets away to d6, let's say. But never mind. Uh, knight e8 was played and now king c5. Just stepping aside from this fork. Because here, rook takes e5 would just lead to a draw, I think. Knight c7, king c6, takes, takes, and knight e6. And with the pawns being on both flanks, even if black manages to, to get a pawn, uh, the king cannot support because there is, a, there is a pawn on the queen side. So here he plays king c5 and now knight c7. Now black took a chance and uh, took on e5 and now you cannot take on e6 because after king d5 there is double attack on the knight and the rook so that's game over and that's why white plays rook h4 first hoping for h5 and then capturing the pawn on e6. But of course uh, black played the uh, an in-between move, which is king d6, attacking the knight and kicking it from attacking e6. So he gave a check, king d7, and now he he's using the fact that this is impossible since knight f7 loses the piece on b5. Double attack on the rook and the knight, and that's game over. So white chose to play a4 now, fixing the knight. And now this threat is for real. Rook takes h6. That's why black plays h5. Knight d4 and the rook has to stay to keep an eye on the pawn on h5. 
rookie four by white and now one check rookie five a very nice move and now white is in a dilemma because do you want to exchange rooks or not that's the question right now i believe this position after 95 92 has some chances gives some chances to, to white because like in the previous case without the support of the king it's tough to to make any progress because the king has to always keep an eye on these two pawns on the queen side and the knight alone can hardly do anything Also, if you imagine that uh, we eliminate th these two pawns, which is very likely to happen, then the chances even increase. So, I don't know what to think about this. If this is practically better choice than what happened in the game. But white played rook h4, he avoided this. Black goes to d6, and now king d3. The point of king d3 is to stop this maneuver, knight e4, knight c5, which is aimed against the a4 pawn. That's why king d3 is played. And now rook d5. Now e5 is a threat. So white is trying to attack the, the rook. Rook g5, and now knight f3. And the only issue for black here is that his rook is a bit stuck defending this h5 pawn. But luckily for him, he doesn't have enough disturbance on the way. It's only the knight and nothing else. If there was a pawn on d4, let's say, or some bishop, that would be much more dangerous. But this way, he can keep an eye on h5 pretty easily. Knight d2. Rook f5 and now knight to b3. Now the knight goes to b7. He vacates the d6 square for the king. And now we get knight c5. Now the a4 pawn is uh, guilty for exchanging the knights. There's no way to defend the a4 pawn, so white took on c5, king c5, and now rook e3. And we have a very interesting, mom very important moment in the game, in which a black plays a very logical move at the at the first glance, and that's e5. But actually, that's a mistake. And the best way to go here was to go h4 to advance this pawn, and for example, in case of rook e6, to go rook f3. And if the king goes back, to go rook h3. And now this h-pawn is going to drop. If you defend like rook e2, then king takes c4. And I don't believe that uh, white can hold this endgame. Because also the a4-pawn becomes a huge target. And with the rook being so passive on e2, I don't see how... How does white save this game at a suitable moment he can just move the rook push it push this pawn to h3 and uh, somehow get his rook to g2 and that way either he is going to force the exchange of rooks or he's going to take the pawn on h2 and in this position if he goes if he goes rook e5, let's say. Well, my chest base is just dead. If he goes rook e5, then you can take on c4. And in case of this, well, we get something similar to previously. And now black has a very pleasant choice how to win this game, actually, because... He can go to d3 and uh, go all the way to the king side. And 
probably just force an exchange of rooks. But even to play the e5, just uh, advancing his e pawn. Oh, this is not working. Okay, e5. And, and now Magnus plays a really good move, h4. The point behind this is to not allow the pawn to move any forward. And also to limit the rook on f5. So now black uh, cannot make any improvements without moving the king back to d6. So he did that. But now it allows some activity to white. King e6. Rook g3. I think still it's not possible to go rook d5 because of e4. So, for example, here... No, this is dead. I mean, my program is dead. Rook d5, then e4 can be played and the king can just enter like this. So, rook g3 was much better. Sorry about this, it's just my laptop. And now king f6, rook d3, rook f4, and black gave up the pawn, but he took on h4 in the end. But white has a c-pawn. He pushed c5, black took on a4, and now his only hope is to somehow push his c-pawn and to, to exchange it for the e-pawn. And Magnus plays rook h6 here, which is a mistake. Uh, here he should have played c6. Come on. Come on, push c6. Yeah, that's right. And if the king goes back to e6... Well, then I think you can just go c7 and if this... If king d7, rook b5. And again, my program is dead. Damn it. Rook b5 and... If you defend like this, well, if you take it on c7, I take on e5, and on h4, I think just this works pretty fine. And now Black, Black, Black's Rook cannot uh, defend both pawns. If it goes here, then I go Rook h5 and collect on h4. Uh, so, if it goes to e4, then king goes to d3, rook e1, this, and we can repeat like this, or black can give up the e-pawn by doing this, let's say, something like that. King c8, and now the king, uh, the king has to go back to support, to stop the a-pawn, and... They just split tasks. Uh, the rook on c5 keeps an eye on the h-pawn and the king keeps an eye on the a-pawn. So if we have something like this, a3, king b1, h4, king a1, rook g2, just rook h5 and there's no progress to be made. King takes and on king takes c7, king b2. It's very important to to keep this king on b2 and what do you do if king goes to d6 then you might just push the king closer and closer because now if you push the pawn i think you can just 
cut off rook f5 and you don't want to allow the king to get to h2 because in that case the rook is free and uh, when the king is so far away it's impossible to to do anything I think there is something called Vantura's defense in such positions when the pawn is not on h2, when it's on the third rank. When you have to uh, when you have to keep a rook on the third rank to give checks. When the king is on e4, let's say. Then you have to get your rook to the third rank and in case he wants to get to g2 you just give checks on the second rank or third rank and that's how you keep a draw but i might make a, a video on this theoretical endgame i don't know this by heart uh, so let's go back to what happened in the game in the game magnus played rook h6 and now black plays king e4. Uh, the issue with the white's position here is that he's going to lose the c pawn and uh, black is going to give it up either for a or h pawn. He's going to keep the e pawn and that's what makes white's position lost. Because in the previous case the king was too far from both pawns, a and h pawns, and that's why uh, white could have taken one of them but in this case when both pawns are under control it's impossible to do anything so magnus plays rook d6 here uh, if he played if he took on h5 which seems like the most logical move then king d5 would happen and on c6 just give a check and then take the pawn and we would have something similar to the game, but in the game we had h and e pawn. So rook d6 is played, just trying to cut off the king, not to allow any king d5 and attacking the pawn, but black plays rook d4. And finally he gets king d5 in, white takes on a5, but it's a small consolation prize because after rook c4 king d3 he takes on c5 and now rook a4 by white and now black plays very simple rook c7 although he could have played maybe even a move like e4 a bit flashy to advance his pawn and to use the fact that this is impossible since there's rook c3 and after this the king is just shouldering the king he gets to g2 and then he starts pushing the pawn. The point here is not to allow the king to get to the corner. And that's when the h pawn can run. But rook c7 seemed uh, more safe and rook h4, rook h7. This is the best, the best possible setup to put the rook behind the pawn. And now the rook on h4 is practically blocked practically stuck uh, trying to stop the h pawn and uh, we have a couple of more moves white can black can just infinitely wait with his rook and uh, trying to out tempy white and that's what happens the king just steps from e4 which was perfect for white but he doesn't have any useful moves so king f5 is gonna happen King e2, king g5, and on rook e4, now rook e8. Now it's time to push the h pawn. King e3 by Magnus, h4, and on king e2, now black finds a nice way to finish the game, and that's h3. And now it seems like after h2, king g2, white is gonna take the h pawn, but the issue with this is that after queening and king f5 rook going back to e1 there's rook g8 
And White's King is cut off completely from the action. And now the Black Spawn can just run. E4 and with the King's help, it's gonna just advance too much. White played this, but after King F4, Rook F1, King E3, White resigned because there's no hope against the e pawn. If you give a check on e1, there's King f2 even. And because of back rank, you cannot take the pawn. And white just loses the, the rook. So if you wait like this, then just e4 is going to happen and. Something like king d2, e3, e2, and it's a very simple win. Forming a bridge, a well-known bridge, and winning the game. So, that was it. I think the trouble began with the move g5 here. The move g5 just allowed white uh, allowed black to get some counterplay and it wasn't so pleasant to play afterwards it was objectively maybe fine but practically speaking i think it was very very unpleasant for white because the king was a bit shaky all the time and when the rooks when the rook got active then it became even more unpleasant in the next video, I'm going to cover the game 13 between Rajabov and Carlsen, so stay tuned and I'll see you soon.